now would invite anyone who would like to join me for the bracha for study Baruch Ata Aronai Eloheinu Melech Haolam Asher Kidshanu B'mitzvotah V'tzivanu La'asok B'divrei Torah. So uh, good news, we have completed three of the five chapters of Pirkei Avot, and today we begin chapter four with some of the most familiar and cherished of the teachings of Pirkei Avot, and really in all of the Jewish traditions. So I anticipate that at least one of the Mishnayot that we're going to be examining this morning will be familiar um, to many of us. Um, really some wonderful teachings here. And I've brought some additional commentary uh, from this excellent edition of Pirkei Avot which is the, it says the Jerusalem edition, but it's really just the one that's published by the, the Koran publishing uh, house, which is really, really does some very nice job, not only with the, the content, but also just with the format. Like they, they tend to invest a little bit more than many Israeli book publishers in quality book binding um, so that they won't, I don't know about you, but if you have any number of like Israelis forums some traditional books that are published in Israel, they fall apart on first use. Um, so this will not. It's a really nice addition to your Jewish library. I highly recommend it. So I'll be doing a little bit for, of sharing from this volume, as well as um, whatever we unpack together on Safaria. Um, so with that in mind, we've already said our bracha. I'm going to bring on screen uh, the text for Pirkei Avot, chapter four, Mishnah number one. Um, just uh, let me let me locate it first. Here we go. I have I have a lot of different tabs open. Um, so that we can do a little bit of, of proof texting this morning, um, which is part of, part of the tradition, um, is, uh, is to look at the sources that the rabbis cite from the Tanakh, from the Hebrew Bible. Um, okay, here we go. So Pirkei Avot chapter four. Um, we're starting with a figure whose name I do not think has yet been recalled for us in this class, but may be familiar from, for instance, the Passover Haggadah. And his name is, as you can see here in Hebrew, or down here in the English, Ben Zoma, um, Ben Zoma Omer. Um, so Ben Zoma, interestingly, is one of the sages who does not go by the title of rabbi. What does this mean? It means either he did not attain the qualification of rabbi, or just as likely he chose not to use the title of rabbi. We don't really know exactly who was the first sage in the Jewish tradition to go by the title rabbi. We see over the course of Pirkei Avot that at some point midway through the first century um, that we do have sages or teachers who are identified as rav or rabbi, or Rabban, uh, all derivatives of the word that means rabbi or teacher. Um, so it's not, it's not clear to me why Ben Zoma was not a rabbi. Um, and again, this wonderful feature on Safari, you can now click the name of the sage, either in Hebrew or in English, and it links over to a sidebar here. Um, so you can see, actually, the guy did have a first name. Uh, he, he was normally called Ben Zoma, but he was a Shimon, Simon. Um, and he lived in the fourth generation of the Mishnaic teachers, known here, as you see, as Tanaim, which is the Aramaic word for Mish derived from Mishnah to teach. Much of Shimon Ben Zoma's career paralleled that of his namesake, Shimon Ben Azai. He too studied under Rabbi Yehoshua before coming one of Rabbi Akiva's greatest students. And a very, very curious phrase here. He too was overwhelmed when entering the orchard. Well, uh, that requires quite some background information. Um, so Benzoma is one of four sages who are said in Jewish tradition to have entered a pardes or an orchard. Um, so this is a legend that is told in the uh, Agadah, in the Jewish um, lore, about four rabbis of the Mishnaic period, approximately, again, the first of the second century of the common era, who visited a pardes, uh, 
Pei Resh Dalet Samech is the Hebrew word for an orchard. And only one of the four sages succeeded in leaving the orchard unscathed. So the basic story goes as follows. It says four entered a pardes, Ben Azai, Ben Zoma, Acher, we'll talk about who Acher is, and Rabbi Akiva. And then it says, one looked and died, one looked and went crazy, one looked and became an apostate, and one entered in peace and departed in peace, departed in the sense of left the orchard. Okay, I mean, this is, it, it, this is about as weird as it gets for something that is uh, not esoteric in the sense that this is kind of a legend that many are familiar with. Um, you find this, by the way, recorded in several sources, this legend. Um, so there is uh, a record of it in the Babylonian Talmud in tractate Chagiga 14b. It is also in the Jerusalem Talmud, the Talmud Yerushalmi, or the so-called Palestinian Talmud, written in Roman Palestine in the first several centuries of the Common Era, also Tractate Chagiga, Chapter 9, Mishnah, or Teaching Number 1. It is also in a Tosefta. Tosefta is a Hebrew word that means additional. So it's in an additional extra Talmudic source on Tractate Chagiga. Chagiga is nominally about the uh, Pesach festival offering, not the Pesach offering, but the, the second offering for the Chag, um, symbolized on the Seder plate by the egg. None of that is particularly relevant. I just want to point out that this legend pops up in multiple sources. So I'm going to read it again in English, just so you can follow. Four entered an orchard or a pardes. Ben Azai, Ben Zoma, Acher, which literally means the other guy or the outsider, the other, we'll talk about him, and Rabbi Akiva. One looked and died, one looked and went crazy, one looked and became an apostate, we'll talk about what that means, and one entered and left in peace. First of all, just show of hands, is anyone familiar with this legend? So it's a very um, interesting story that is memorialized in a wonderful book that if you have not read or have not read in a long time, I, I must commend to you. And that is called As a Driven Leaf by the wonderful author and rabbi Milton Steinberg, um, who died very young. Um, so the book was written probably as a driven leaf, I want to say in the 1950s. I'm sure some of you have read As a Driven Leaf. Um, wonderful story that really uh, humanizes and personalizes the life and times of the Mishnaic sages and whose central character is a rabbi named Elisha ben Abuya, who becomes an apostate, that is to say he forsakes his Jewish tradition in favor of Greek learning, uh, or that is to say secular wisdom. Um, and it really shows the intersection between uh, Jews uh, and their tradition and the challenges of assimilation and living in a mixed culture where Jews were no longer the majority, no longer had political sovereignty, um, no longer had military power. Um, so really, I think dramatizes very humanly uh, the milieu in which the Mishnaic sages were living. It is not a dry read. It really is a page turner. Um, and basically, this character, Elisha ben Abuya, um, and all of this draws on Talmudic legend and lore, so it's really fun. You can actually look up the original sources and see how they have been novelized. Um, but there's a story that Elisha ben Abuya saw a child climbing a tree to retrieve eggs from a mama bird's nest. And he did what the book of Deuteronomy commands a Jew to do, which is that if you're going to take eggs from a nest or fledglings, little birdies, you must first shoo away the mother bird. So presumably so that the mother bird will not be traumatized by watching her young taken right out from under her beak, right? Or her feet, I suppose, right? That, that's the idea. It is one of a very few commandments in the Torah that is accompanied by a 
promise of reward. So most commandments in the Torah are either cause and effect, mostly in the negative. If you do this bad thing, then you will be punished in X way. Very few commandments in the Torah, though, promise a reward for following them. Really only two. Uh, and most of the other commandments are what are called apodictic law, which basically means you do it because it's the law, heedless of a punishment or reward, which is not stipulated in the text. So there's apodictic law, which is you just do it because it's the law, or there's casuistic law from, you know, like causus, uh, to ca cause and effect, right? If you do X, X will, Y will happen, usually a punishment. So in other words, if you violate X precept or law, you will be punished in a certain way. I recognize I'm being very discursive here. I promise I'm gonna bring this all back together. Um, so two laws in the Torah, however, promise some kind of reward. One of them is the law to honor thy father and mother. It says that you may long endure in the land that God is giving you. And it's very interesting of all the 10 commandments, the only one that is accompanied by a promise of reward is honor thy father and mother. Um, and the sages, of course, have much to say about that. Many of them say, well, that's because it's the hardest law to follow. Um, and therefore, the, the would-be doer needs to be incentivized to follow the law. So a promise of an earthly reward. If, if, if you honor your parents, you will long endure in the land that God is giving you. You can read a whole lot more into it. Not today. The other one is the much more obscure law about the bird's nest. If you seek to take eggs or fledglings from a bird's nest, first shoo away the mother bird, that you may have long life is basically what it says. So the legend goes that Elisha ben Abuya, this sage, sees a child climbing a tree, does what the Torah tells him to, shoes away the mother bird, takes the eggs and falls and lands on his head and dies. So Elisha ben Abuya is traumatized by this experience. And not only that, he rejects God and God's judgment. He says, uh, late Dean, the late Dayan in the, in the Talmud. And of course, this is dramatized beautifully in Steinberg's novel. Um, there is no justice and there is no judge. So he, for, he forsakes God. He denies God because he says no good God would allow a young child to perish in such a horrific way, especially immediately after following a commandment of the Torah that promises long life. So this is the story that's told about this sage who goes off and is basically self-excommunicated and excommunicated by his colleagues from the community of rabbis and from Jewish teaching and Jewish learning. The rest of the novel kind of takes it from there. It's a really fascinating book. I, I can't recommend it highly enough. One of my favorites, As a Driven Leaf. Um, Elisha ben Abuya becomes such a notorious figure in Jewish legend that he is often called Acher, the other, because he forsook Jewish tradition and Jewish teaching and denied God, right? He is the rabbi who denied God and denied God's justice. And so, the rabbis don't even want to give him the kavod, the honor of having his name remembered. So they call him Acher. It's sort of like Voldemort in the Harry Potter books, right? He's so bad, you don't even say his name. And most people refer to the villain of the, the Potter stories, including the characters, of course, as he who shall not be named, right? So that's the Elisha ben Abuya of the Harry Potter world is, is Lord Voldemort. He who shall not be named. Now, Alicia ben Abuya is the other in this really bizarre story of the four sages who entered the orchard. By this point, you probably have conjectured that this is not a literal apple orchard full of trees that the four sages entered, right? It is a metaphor for studying the Jewish tradition. And some of you who study Torah on the reg every week, week in, week out at our Saturday morning Torah study know of a methodology for learning Torah called Pardes, which means orchard. But it is also an acronym where each of the four letters in Pardes indicate a different way of approaching Jewish text and Jewish learning. There's Peshat, that's the pay of Pardes. Peshat means the surface or simple meaning, 
what is the text actually saying? Who's the subject? What's the predicate? What's the object, right? What, what's happening? Number two, um, uh, pardes, so the reish is remez, um, which literally means a hint or a clue. A Jewish text is in part Jewish because of the way in which we study it, right? It, it, the text itself may not have hidden meaning that was intended by the authors to be revealed. Nevertheless, the Jewish approach to learning from a text is that there's always a deeper meaning to mine from the text. So remez, which means a hint or a clue, is the deep dive that one might take to examine what treasures a Jewish text might hold for us. Even if you did not know this methodology or this terminology, you are familiar with this by experience because that's what we do here in our learning, right? We try and take a text and do a very deep, very close read as opposed to skimming through and saying, okay, the shot meaning of this text is such and so, let's move on to the next one, right? We spent, we only get three Mishnayot. We haven't even, <laughs> we've done one, we've done two words, Benzoma, <laughs> Benzoma Omer. And I'm, this is all about who is Benzoma. Okay. The third level of Jewish encounter with the text is called dirash, with a dalit. That's the dalit of pardes, the orchard of Jewish study. Dirash means the deepest kind of exploration or examination and making meaning out of a text. That is also what we do, right? Once we've done a deep critical analysis of the text, we have to get to the next level. So what does this mean? That's the part where I open up the microphones and say, okay, what does this mean to you, right? How, what do you take away from this text, which we do in every class? Finally, there is sod, the samech of pardes. Sod literally means um, a secret. Um, usually in the Jewish tradition, this refers to the most esoteric or mystical level of the text, right? What how does this text bring us into relationship with the numinous, a favorite word of mine, um, the divine, the holy, the sublime, right? How does this text provide a kind of portal to the divine encounter, the secret dimension of the text or the mystical dimension of the text? So pe reish dalit samach pardes, the orchard of Jewish study. And there's this very curious, very strange story told of four sages who entered a pardes and different things happened to them. One, it says he looked and he died. The other one looked and went mad, he went crazy. The third one, really interesting here, remember the third guy in the text is the one who, this is Acher, this is Elisha Ben Abuya. It says he looked and became an apostate. He, he left the Jewish tradition. He, he, he forswore Judaism. And the other was able to enter the orchard and leave in peace. So what the heck does this mean, by the way? And I would add one other thing. The word pardes itself, I said it's an acronym in Jewish tradition. It's actually not an indigenous Hebrew word. Um, it is the Persian or Avastan, which is ancient Persian, uh, the ancient Persian sacred languages of Avastan, um, is the word pardes. Um, it is also the root of a word that you know, which is paradise, right? So immediately we sense that this is not an earthly orchard, but this is some kind of sacred encounter, some kind of um, almost occult encounter, right? Something is happening here in this orchard that the rabbis are fascinated by, that they liken to the Jewish experience of encountering the text. One looks and goes uh, and dies, one looks and goes mad, one becomes an apostate, and only one, Rabbi Akiva, by the way, leaves, uh, comes and goes in peace. I mean, the others, by the way, as, I, as I've said before, are Ben Azai, Ben Zoma, who, by the way, remember what we just learned, Ben Zoma is Ben Azai's namesake, disciple, and, and, uh, and pupil, and follower. So Ben Azai, Ben Zoma, they're both named Shimon. Shimon Ben Azai, Shimon Ben Zoma. Ben Zoma is the one who reputedly became demented, though there's a dispute about that. The two different records of the, uh, of the legend 
actually differ on which one died and which one went crazy. Everyone believes that Alicia Benabuya or Acher, the other, he who shall not be named, is the one who became an apostate because he left the Jewish tradition entirely. He, he, he uh, renounced God and we shall never speak of him again. And everybody agrees that it is Akiva who made it out alive. All right, a this is a very long 20 minute introduction to Benzoma. Um, any thoughts on what this legend is trying to tell us about the sacred encounter with Jewish learning? Some pretty wild stuff here. I don't think you want to hear that it's only a 25% chance of success. Okay, right. <laughs> That's one thing. One is that, um, yeah, exactly. Only one sage makes it out alive. Not everybody leaves the encounter with the sacred tradition uh, unscathed. What else? Russell. I'm very fascinated that one of them dies um, because it's not clear to me which of the four of them <laughs> is the one who actually has died. One it's not clear to the rabbis of the Talmud either, by the way. They, they, oh, right? It remains it remains unresolved. It's either Ben Azai or Ben Zoma. Well, and the reason why that question appeals to me is that one of the things that always moves me about our annual uh, reading of the Torah, even, even the uh, reading only a third of it, is that it begins with essentially God breathing life into Adam. Life, and it's living is a passive thing. It's something that's given to you. And by the time we get to Deuteronomy, it says, choose life if you would live. Uh, so life is no longer just something that happens to you or that is given to us, but it's something we choose for ourselves. I think that one of the lessons that one can take away from that is that if we study this, this brings a new meaning to us of what is life and what is death. Uh, the, to live is, is more than just to breathe or be breathed into, but to live is to make the choices that make, that make a life. You know, in, in, in the poetic sense. And so when it says that one of these lived, one of them died, one of, it, is the one who was excommunicated, the one, <laughs> the one who died? Um, Probably not. The one who's, and by the way, the word, the phrase, even, even the fact that he was excommunicated is an interpretation of what the text literally says. What the text literally says is that the other, the one who shall not be named, who the Talmud later identifies as Alicia Benabuya, the apostate, he cut the plantings. Okay. Well, but what it comes down to is that it reiterates in my mind the fact that this study is not simply reading books or making rhetorical observation. It's inviting us to choose a kind of life or to choose a kind of death. Yeah. Thank you. I think that's, that's really uh, on the mark. And both your and Michelle's comment suggests that it is not a given that one will be blessed with the rich and full rewarding life that is associated with Jewish wisdom, that there is also danger. Um, and, and it doesn't stipulate what it is, which is what makes this text so much fun to, to consider. Um, but I think we all know, uh, you know, people say this to me all the time, that the reason that they are, and maybe it's a cop out, I think for some people it is, but the reason they don't participate in the life of the synagogue is because they are distrustful of organized religion altogether, right? So it, it may have been known or understood by the rabbis that the, that religion, that you know, entering the orchard of the spiritual life can in fact be life affirming and life enhancing, or it can actually pull a person away from the world of um, you know, what God, I guess, in, in God's greatness and, and goodness wants for his creation, for God's creation, to live full, uh, valuable, loving lives. Um, so I, I, I sense that there's some 
possibly coded message here about be careful um, because our tradition does not smile on people who become religious ascetics, people who become hermetically sealed off from the rest of the, the, act, the, the actual world of creation, people who are so immersed, so saturated in their visions of God that they forget how to be a human being. And if you think about that in the context of Pirkei Avot, I think it's, it's particularly powerful because most of Pirkei Avot, while rigorously encouraging a life of study and mitzvot, contains many cautions, both explicit as we have seen in the past several weeks, and I would say here possibly implicit in the story of Benzoma and what happened to this sage, about the danger of going too deep. Any other thoughts? You could go crazy, you could even die. Only one in four, only Rabbi Akiva becomes Rabbi Akiva, the greatest sage of his generation. And Rabbi Akiva, for what it's worth, the many other legends in the Talmud affirm that Rabbi Akiva didn't come to Jewish study until he was 40 years old. Okay, Audrey. Um, wasn't there something a few, a number of weeks ago that you couldn't even take a walk at night? Um, <laughs> right, that's something the- would happen. I don't understand how this uh, it cautions you. Well, now, you- be an ascetic. If you wanted to be human, you were bad too. All I can say is that the, the Jewish wisdom does not typically speak in one voice. And of the many voices that populate the, the, the tradition and that populate Pirkei Avot, you have rabbis who I would say are more extreme in their position about how hermetically sealed off from the world of materialism and commerce and secular activity one must be in order to pursue a, a worthy life of, of Torah and mitzvot and God. And yet, from time to time, you have these cautionary tales. And I think the story of the Pardes is one of the great cautionary tales in all of Judaism. Um, okay, let us proceed. Um, so we've, we've learned a lot about this Benzoma figure. He does turn up in the, the Pesach story. He is one of the Passover, uh, one of the central voices of the Passover Haggadah. So now the next time we have Pesach, um, I hope you will hear Benzoma's name recounted and decide to spend a half hour regaling all of your Seder guests about Benzoma and the parable of the orchard. I promise you, all of your Seder guests will love that. They, they, they'll be like, I, I will be happy to forestall the Pesach meal for another half hour to hear the leader of the Seder hold forth on Benzoma. That'll be, uh, a, sorry to that'll be a hard pass at our Seder, John. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Rabbi, Rabbi, I'm sorry to prolong this, but I, I, I do have a second question. That is, I is am not the, sorry for you to prolong this. I'm enjoying is, this. Is the, is the orchard an allusion to the Garden of Eden? Quite possibly. And the, and, the, and the reason that knowledge. it is a pardes, a paradise, is yes, quite possibly. That this is also possibly an experience of, you know, the, the, the mystical paradise. Yeah. Okay. Um, we'll, one more question uh, that I got through the chat. Isn't there a principle whereby synagogues are supposed to be designed with windows so as to not to pray and study isolated from the outside world? Exactly right. Yes, thank you, questioner. Um, the, the Talmud stipulates that a synagogue's windows must be wider on the outside, uh, or wider on the inside than they are on the outside. It's, it's one way or the other. The idea is that ordinary windows are designed to focus light into the room. They bring light in. Synagogue windows are supposed to reflect light out, which is one of the many ways in which Judaism communicates that what we do in our spiritual pursuit is not to be dissociated from the world of our day-to-day -day pursuits. Ein kemach, ein Torah. We studied this last week, right? Without flour, F-L-O-U-R, without meal, there can be no Torah. Without Torah, there can be no meal. Without material sustenance, we will not be able to pursue the spiritual life. If you don't pay temple dues and you expect that the temple is going to be able not just to keep the lights on, but to do all the good things to help the Jewish people, you got another thing coming. On the other hand, without a rich spiritual life, 
our material pursuits are meaningless, valueless, right? That's the dialectic here. There's this constant tension percolating through Pirkei Avot, percolating through these rabbinic legends about how much am I supposed to be saturated in my Jewish tradition? And is there possibly a breaking point, a point of immoderation, where even the study of Torah, even the life of pursuing God and the spirit is actually spiritually deleterious and even dangerous, right? Isn't that a fascinating idea? Okay, that's our Benzoma for us. And he seems to have maybe gone a little bit too far. Nevertheless, before he went into the orchard and presumably either died or went crazy, because he's one of the four who did not come out, he left behind some of the most cherished teachings in all of Judaism. And we are finally, finally going to get to look at them. So here we go. Um, so Pirkei Avot, chapter four, section one, and I promise no more digressions, but I really wanted to spend some time because I think it illuminates a very important theme of all of Avot. Ben Zoma Omer, Ben Zoma says, Ezehu Chacham, who is wise? Halomed Mikol Adam. This is such lovely, simple, elegant Hebrew. The one who learns, Lomed, like Talmud, Mikol Adam, from every person. Who is wise? One who learns from every person. Let me just close this so that I have a little bit more window to play with. Shene'emar, and here's the proof text, as it is said from Psalms 119, uh, verse 99. What, Psalm 119 is the longest of all of the 150 Psalms of the Hebrew Bible. It has like a ton of verses. Mikol um, melamadai hiskalti. From those who have taught me, have I gained understanding? From those who have taught me, have I gained understanding? Ki edotecha sichali, for their counsel, their testimony, is my meditation, is what I contemplate, is my contemplation or is my conversation. So I am grateful to all who have taught me because what they have given me the way in which they have lifted and illuminated my own understanding has provided me with a lifetime of wisdom to contemplate, meditate, and converse about. Here's how they translate it here. Um, who is wise? He who learns from every man. I don't like the gendered translation. It's not necessarily reflected in the text. As it is said, from all who taught me have I gained understanding. Um, but they, they leave out that beautiful line of ki edotecha sihali, for their testimony is my contemplation. Ezehu gibor, who is strong. So this is following a format, right? Who is wise? The one who learns from every person. Who is mighty? A gibor is a warrior. Ata gibor le'olam Adonai, mechaye hakol atarab lehoshia. You are mighty, O God. Great is your saving power. The second prayer of the Amidah, of the Tefillah, right? Is called the Givurot, literally the might prayer, the prayer about God's power or strength. Ezehu Gibor, who is strong, who is mighty, who is a warrior. Gibor is also the word in Jewish tradition for a warrior. Not Samson, not the one with the biggest bulgingest muscles, but rather Hakovesh et Yitro, as they say here, one who subdues his inclination, or one, I would say, one who can master his impulses. Shene'emar, as it is written, or as it is said in Mishle, Mishle is Proverbs 16, Proverbs chapter 16, Tov erich apaim migibor, even greater is one who is hard to upset. Erich apaim, a phrase that pops up in the liturgy. Um, when we gather on the Chagim or on the uh, high holidays, on the festivals and the holidays, and we approach the Ark, we praise God as possessing many different important attributes that human beings, Jews, are in, instructed to emulate. One of them is we praise God as being Erech Apayim. Um, literally, it means that it takes a long time for God's nose to turn red. It's an af is your nose, right? In Hebrew, most of you who've studied a little bit of Hebrew, Jane Roberts surely is smiling right now, even though I'm not looking at her window because she knows an af is your nose. Um, the biblical idiom for God's wrath, when God gets angry, it says 
God's nose glowed like Rudolph. God's nose turned red. That is the biblical idiom uh, or euphemism for God getting really, really ticked off. God's nose glowed. So a person who is erech apaim literally means that his noses are long, which is <laughs> not like your Pinocchio. It literally means that it takes a long time for your nose to glow. Erech apaim is a spiritual attribute of being patient. Takes, takes a lot to get under the skin of a person who is erech apaim. So um, the, the proof text here is, Tov erech apaim, better for one to be patient, mi gibor, than to be a warrior. Umoshel berucho mi lochet ir. And better to master one's ruach. In this case, ruach is your spirit, but it probably means your temper. Better to master your temper than to capture a city. Lochaid ear means to capture a city. So as they translate here, who is mighty? One who subdues the evil inclination or one's, I would say, impulses, one's appetites. Uh, as it is said, he that is slow to anger is better than the mighty and he that rules his spirit better than he that takes a city. We'll finish this text. Um, Eze who ashir, who is rich? Hasameach Bechelko, the one who rejoices in his portion. Shinemar, as it is said from Psalms chapter 128, Yegia Kapecha ki tochel Ashrecha Vetovlach. Literally, um, that which falls into your hand you shall eat. Happy shall be you, you shall be, and it will be good for you or good with you. Or uh, I don't know, can you see the, the window here? You shall enjoy the fruit of your labors. You shall be happy and you shall prosper, as I put in this tab. Um, so they're saying that happiness is not about how much you have. It's about how much you appreciate what you have. Who is happy? The one who rejoices in his portion and the proof text. Um, and then it clarifies the proof text with the coda to the text. So it's three things. Who is wise? Who is mighty? Who is rich? It gives the answer to all three, and then there's a coda. It says, Ashrecha, you shall be happy, as the Psalms say, meaning in this world, vitovlach, and it shall go well for you, you shall prosper, laolam haba. This is just a conventional rabbinic way of reconciling when a text seems to be redundant. In other words, why did the text need to say, you shall be happy, and it will go well for you? Does not the first imply the other? imply the second or does not the second imply the first you don't need to say you shall be happy and it will go well for you but the rabbis the rabbis at least think that it's redundant and so they supply a uh, an explanation that says when it says you shall be happy the first condition means in this world and it shall go well for you in the world to come and this is merely i would say a frame that is consistent with much of pirkei avot that is trying to understand God's justice in the world, which sometimes seems to be sorely lacking. Back to Alicia Benabuya, right? The child who falls out of a tree for following one of God's most, uh, you know, the, the only commandment, or one of the only commandments that promises a reward. Um, where's the justice in that? But the Pirkei Avot's normative tradition is to say, we don't walk away from the injustice of the world and say, I now forsake God, I renounce God, there is no judge, there is no justice, the way Acher did, the way the one who shall not be named did. Rather, we say, God's justice may be experienced in this world, but just as likely in the world to come, when the scales of justice will be righted, and all shall come into balance, so that the good will be rewarded, and the wicked shall be punished. May not happen in your lifetime, but in the next realm of reality in the next existence, in the next phase, God will make sure that justice prevails. Finally, the end of the text here. Um, it goes on to say, um, ba and then it adds one more, which is very interesting. So there's a fourth, it's a, it's a fourfold teaching. Who is esteemed or honored? The one who honors his fellow creation, 
Um, but it literally just says all of creation, the one who honors creation, et habriot, all creatures. Shenamar, as it is said from Samuel 1, chapter 2, ki mechabedai achabed, for those who have honored me, I shall honor, uvozai yekalu, and those who have spurned me shall be um, diminished. Here's how they translate it. They say dishonored. He who honors his fellow human, who is honored, the one who honors his fellow human beings, that is to say, for I honor those that honor me, but those who spurn me shall be dishonored. And the passage there, just so that you can see it, is from 1 Samuel chapter 2. This is the story that we read in the Haftarah for Rosh Hashanah morning, the story of Hannah, the woman who is barren, who seeks children, and who pleads before the priest Eli, um, for children, but because she's muttering to herself in prayer, or murmuring to herself in prayer, she, he initially thinks that she's drunk, um, but he realizes that uh, she's not drunk, and in fact has a, a, a noble petition before God, and she does become pregnant, and upon the news of her pregnancy, she delivers this beautiful prayer, which, by the way, in the Latin becomes the text of the often set to music church text of the Magnificat, my heart exalts in the Lord, uh, magnificat anima mea, I have triumphed through the Lord. So this is Hannah's prayer. And then at the end of the chapter where the proof text is taken, um, uh, this is Eli, the high priest, now speaking to Hannah's son, who is to grow up to become the prophet Samuel. Um, and he's charging him uh, as a prophet. And... Um, the line comes up, he says, uh, this is Samuel's prophecy to the Jewish people, assuredly declares the Lord, the God of Israel, I intended for you and your father's house to remain in my service, divine service forever, but now declares the Lord, far be it from me, for I honor those who honor me, but those who spurn me shall be dishonored. So Hannah's son grows up to be a prophet forecasting doom and destruction for the Jewish people. Okay, we've covered a lot of ground here. Let's open this up for comment on the wonderful teaching of Ben Zoma, a very, very strange and mysterious figure in Jewish legend, nevertheless, one of the great teachers of our tradition who said, who is wise, who is rich, who is, who is mighty, who is rich, and who is honored, and provides very meaningful answers for all of them. I'm sure this text is familiar to many of you. So what are your, what are your thoughts here? One way to answer the question is, do you buy it? Do you accept the premise that wisdom, wealth, honor, strength are not what we may associate them with being? What does this text teach us about Judaism as a whole? What does this text teach us about the meaning of a, a good life or a life of goodness, which is, of course, the overarching objective of Pirkei Avot? What does this text have to say to young rabbis in training? Dad, you're on. There's certainly a part of this that makes me uncomfortable. And I think it's the, it's the notion of looking at it that if things don't work out well now, the score is going to be you know, settled up to your advantage in, you know, ha'olam haba or at some other time. It seems to me that the Judaism has evolved beyond this concept, this construct, because I think the, you know, there are two ways of work, looking at it. And I think, you know, more to the Christian point of view that your rewards are in heaven if they weren't on earth. You know, I think Judaism has evolved beyond that to say that Maybe that's not the way the cosmos is wired. Thank you. Great. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me that of all the things in this text that are meaningful and comforting, um, perhaps the line, the one line about, well, prosperity. Remember, this is in response to the line about material wealth, right? So who is rich? The one who is satisfied with his portion, which sounds nice but you know much better it's much better to have some money right <laughs> yeah all you have to do is 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 watch uh, billions 
or, right. or watch Succession. Right. You know, you say, yeah, well, be happy with your lot. But if you have your own helicopter, you know, that's probably right. a little bit better. Yeah. And Judaism, unlike some uh, spiritual traditions, does not, in fact, encourage the pursuit of poverty in the process of spiritual refinement. It, it wants to make the case at times in the Jewish literature that there is no dishonor in poverty, uh, in material poverty. But it also wants to make it clear that there's no honor in poverty, right? Like Jews generally are not encouraged to uh, live like paupers, and and that that inflects the whole tradition. Like even something like uh, Maimonides' Laws of Tzedakah. I'm sure you're familiar with Maimonides' teaching that a person should reserve 10% of one's income to give to tzedakah. What you may not be familiar with is the very next line in Maimonides' Mishnah Torah, which says. However, a person may not give more than 20% of his income away. Because if one jeopardizes one's own well-being in being charitable to others, he has or she has only themselves to blame. Right? So you can't give away so much of your wealth that you actually make it impossible for you to, to live. It's a fascinating thing that most people are not aware of that there's actually a limit placed on how much charity one may give. Obviously, this does not anticipate the Bill Gateses of the world who could give away 90% of their wealth and still live comfortably for the rest of their lives, their children's lives, their great grandchildren's lives. Michelle. So I, for change, don't have an answer or a solution. I'm, I'm, trying to figure out how to understand the four goals that are offered here. Wisdom, might, um, material wealth, or not, richness, <laughs> and, um, and honor. Yeah. And why those, that set should be addressed. Great. I don't know, um, but I will tell you that those four correspond to four W's that I often uh, name as the optimal characteristics of a synagogue leader. Now, this is true for any nonprofit, any board really, benefits from having people in leadership who have one or more of the following attributes. One is wisdom. And they, they begin with W, right? One is wisdom, one is wealth, one is wallop, and the other is work. Wallop is a word that I use to associate with one's clout in the community, right? So, and Malcolm Gladwell, the kind of pop sociologist, writes about this in his first and I think best book, The Tipping Point, um, when he talks about on the night of uh, Paul Revere's ride, where he said the redcoats are coming, the red, the British are coming, right? And all the people mustered, and that's how you know the first battle of the Revolutionary War unfolded. That the the you know the Minutemen were ready. That's the the folk tale that's told. Gladwell actually exposes the fact that there was a second rider. No one even remembers his name. I don't know his name. Um, who also went on a route and said the exact same thing. And it turns out that everyone along that guy's ride didn't show up the next morning with their guns. And why is that? Because Paul Revere was a macher. Paul Revere was a guy that like everyone in colonial Boston society knew. He was, you know, he was a prominent public figure. He had wallop. He was a connector is the word that Gladwell uses, right? So when Paul Revere says the British are coming, everyone pays attention. When Joe Schmendrick says the British are coming, nobody shows up. So you want people who have wallop working in your organization. Wisdom, wealth, work, and wallop. Work is not quite the same as honor, by the way. I'll, I'll give you that. You want people who have great thoughts. You want people who can contribute financially to the organization. You want people who, are, who have clout in the community. And you want people who are willing to roll up their sleeves. Um, it's not a bad, you know, analog to some of the things that are considered desirable attributes. I think the other thing that's meaningful here is that 
the, the text wants to unconfuse us about what real value is in any of these four domains, right? It is, and so here's where I'm gonna do a little bit of reading for you. Um, I promised a little bit of sharing from, from this edition, which I love. So please bear with me. This is just from the, uh, the editor of the Koran um, uh, translation. By the way, the translation is by the great late Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, Sichonoli Vracha, who died last year, uh, the great chief, former chief rabbi of Britain uh, and wonderful teacher uh, and moral teacher. And the commentary is by, um, I think it's Rabbi Mark Angel. Yeah, Rabbi Mark D. Angel, a wonderful commentary. So here's what he says. Who is wise, who is strong, who is rich, who is honored? A great artist once said, when I wish to see clearly, I close my eyes. He was alluding to two ways of perceiving reality. With eyes open, one sees surface reality. But with eyes shut, one contemplates the context and the hidden meaning of things. To see clearly entails going beyond superficial appearances. Benzoma teaches the need to view reality with our eyes closed, contemplating ultimate truth rather than focusing on shallow appearances. With our eyes open, we may think of a wise person as one who has attained great knowledge. But with our eyes closed, we realize that wisdom is measured by quality and not merely by quantity. One who learns from everyone has the intellectual curiosity and humility, which are the real sine qua non of wisdom. With our eyes open, we see that a strong person has physical strength. But with our eyes closed, we realize that one with moral self-control may have much greater strength of character than the so-called hero. With our eyes open, a rich person is one with many possessions. With our eyes closed, we understand that real wealth is embodied in an attitude of satisfaction and gratitude for what one has. With our eyes open, an honored person is one receiving public accolades. With our eyes closed, we recognize that superficial honors are ultimately meaningless. Real honor derives from honoring others, from living in a respectful relationship with others. The ancient Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu expressed a similar insight. If you understand others, you are smart. If you understand yourself, you are illuminated. If you overcome others, you are powerful. If you overcome yourself, you have strength. If you know how to be satisfied, you are rich. And the Stoic philosopher Epictetus taught, who is the rich man? The one who is content. So it seems that some of these teachings are, uh, they populate other world traditions as well. But isn't that a lovely uh, teaching, the whole idea about if you wanna perceive reality, close your eyes. Um, and that the way things appear, what we associate with wealth, wisdom, honor, strength, is not actually what our tradition asks us to perceive as valuable. Any further comment on the wonderful teaching of Benzoma? Okay, let's move forward. Uh, just looking, okay, here we go. Um, so this is uh, Pirkei Avot chapter four, Mishnah number two. It's a quick one, Ben Azai, who is Ben Zoma's namesake and teacher, Shimon Ben Azai, Omer, Heve ratz le mitzvah kala ke vachamura. Run. It literally, ratz means run. Be quick in performing a mitzvah kala. Mitzvah kala literally means a light mitzvah. It could be an easy mitzvah. It could be a quote unquote small mitzvah. It's interesting that the text acknowledges that there are such things as light mitzvahs and heavy mitzvahs, big mitzvahs and small mitzvahs, even though it does not tell us exactly which ones they are. I mean, what is a big mitzvah? Maybe a big mitzvah is, um, you know, honor thy father and mother, and a small mitzvah is um, don't forget to tithe your produce every spring. But I don't know. It doesn't actually tell us that anywhere in the text that this is a small mitzvah, this is a big one. So it seems to be a matter of some subjective perception here. Be as quick to do a big mitzvah as you, or be as quick rather to do a small mitzvah as kuva chamura, literally a heavy one. Chamur means serious or heavy. Light, here they say a minor commandment as in the case of a major commandment. Uvoreach min ha'avera, 
and run away. So run toward a mitzvah, run away from an avera, a transgression. Avera is a transgression. Why? She mitzvah go rare mitzvah. Um, some people may, may know there's a little Jewish song. I think it's written by uh, cantor Jeff Klepper and Danny Friedlander. Mitzvah go rare mitzvah. Avera go rare it, avera, which is the next line here. So a mitzvah go rare it, mitzvah. One mitzvah leads to another mitzvah. And one transgression leads to another transgression. Full stop. Shesachar mitzvah, mitzvah. The reward of a mitzvah is a mitzvah. The here it says the reward for performing a commandment is another commandment. We'll talk about that. Usachar avera, avera. And the so-called reward, though I might say result or consequence, the reward for committing a transgression is a transgression. All right, what is this? <laughs> what's this text all about? Three parts. Run to do a small mitzvah as, as quickly as you would run to do a big one. And it goes on to say, uh, and flee from a transgression. Uh, full stop, let me put it back on the screen so that I'm not trying to do this from memory. So run to do a small mitzvah even as you would a big one flee from a transgression. And here's the reasoning behind it. For one mitzvah leads to a mitzvah and a transgression leads to a transgression. The reward for a mitzvah is a mitzvah. The reward for a transgression is a transgression. What does this mean? What does it imply? Is this familiar to you, by the way? Do you accept the concept of reward and punishment for doing a mitzvah? And if so, or if not, what does this text offer by way of working through the either, you know, the, the nice things or the, or the challenging things about reward and punishment in the context of doing the right thing and doing the wrong thing? Audrey. Well, I think it's a question of stay the course of the the narrow straight and narrow and you'll be okay you'll stay on that as opposed to wavering because you might fall off the straight and narrow yeah i mean there's definitely you know to extend where you're going i think with this uh there's definitely an Im implied slippery slope here right that, that if you stay the course one mitzvah will naturally lead to the next right the way in which you or the, the old adage about how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time, but a little bit more than that. Once you start doing mitzvot, the, the natural result is that you will do, it will open the avenue, it will open the door to doing more mitzvot. It will keep you on the path. Whereas to transgress leads you further down the path of transgression. Uh, thank you, Audrey. Michelle. Are there big mitzvot and small mitzvot, or are they in fact traditionally all the same? Well, that's uh, I think one of the uh, theological weight. Yeah, that's why I said like, well, what's really going on? I, I muted you by accident, but um, or maybe you muted yourself. Like, what is what do we mean a small mitzvah and a big mitzvah, especially if the text does not tell us what they are? Or is the idea to say? If you, if you perceive that one mitzvah is either light, and again, it says a minor and a major commandment, but I'm not sure it literally means that. It says a light mitzvah and a heavy mitzvah. So maybe the idea is not so much there are commandments that are more important and less important, so much as that there are commandments that are easier to do and commandments that are harder to do, and that we should be most eager to start with the easy ones and it will lead us to the harder ones. That's a, it's, a, it's a bit of a creative interpretation, but I think it's one that is warranted by the literal meaning of the text. The other way of looking at it, of course, is I think the one that your question uh, leads us to consider, which is that, well, how do I know if this is a big mitzvah or a small mitzvah? I mean, one might presume that thou shalt not murder. Well, let's, let's use positive mitzvot because the <laughs> negative ones are incumbent upon all. But like one might assume that, um, teach thy child to swim, right, which could potentially save one's life, is more important than wave a lulav on Sukkot. But I don't know. The text never actually says, 
wave a lulav on Sukkot is more or less important than teach your child to swim. That's a subjective evaluation. So it could mean run toward the ones that seem inconsequential. Don't avoid them just because you think they are less important because all mitzvot provide the reward and the reward is other mitzvot, dad, mom, and then Karen Levin. Maybe I'm just looking at the shot here, but this seems to be pretty clear moral instruction on developing good habits suitable for teenage boys. Thank you for reminding us, the audience of Pirkei Avot, right? Adolescent boys, adolescent boys training for the rabbinate who are not yet teachers, nor are they, you know, they're, they're not just being trained to be learned. They're being trained to be moral exemplars for their communities. Um, and so how do you train a child to be a moral exemplar? You start with mitzvot. And where do you start? You start with the light mitzvot. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, this, this is a nice text in that you don't have to go into the orchard of mystical contemplation to derive meaning from it. It's, it's a highly practical and practicable uh, text here. Um, Karen. Yes, I, I just was going to share my studies from uh, many, many, many years ago in a different city about this very topic of mitzvot. And it came down to kavana. Hmm. Translated, down- kavana means your intention. And you have to go all the way. If you've been studying Mishnah with us uh, since the very beginning of this course of study, which is actually uh, ooh, a year ago, I guess it was only a year ago. I don't know. In COVID, all time is warped. Um, but we were studying Mishnah Shabbat before we started Pirkei Avot. We did an introductory unit on Tractate Shabbat. And you'll recall that in the very first chapter of Mishnah Tractate Shabbat, we talked about the difference between keva, that which is fixed in one's prayer habit, usually prayer, but not only prayer, versus kavana, that which is uh, your intention. So Karen proposes that when it comes to uh, the doing of mitzvot, it all comes down to kavana, that is to say intention. Please continue. Yes, and then the uh, discussion got a little bit deeper about, and this is something um, that Doug was talking about, is how do you teach children the world of humanitarian and the world of mitzvot if you're not doing them, if you're not modeling it? And it goes back to that, that, you know, you what is the intention of how you are teaching this? If this is just, you have to do this, you have to do this because it says so. You know, that's not going to foster a lifetime of mitzvot, which will become more mitzvot and so on. So it, it, it was a very interesting discussion of how that would circle back to you and the responsibility of the kavanah of your own mitzvot and how you teach that to the next generation. Lovely. Thank you. You know, um, a couple of weeks ago, I was, um, I, I picked up a book from the shelf um, that was a collection that I hadn't read yet of early short stories by Kurt Vonnegut, like before he became a, a famous novelist. He had a lot of short fiction, including some science fiction, published uh, in various periodicals and what have you. And the introduction, and I think this was published posthumously, though I could be wrong. And, and I, forgive me, I don't even remember the name of the book. It wasn't at my house. Um, but the introduction was written by Dave Eggers, um, also a, a great novelist, a modern novelist. And um, um, Eggers wrote a kind of azkara or a memorial tribute to Vonnegut, who was one of his literary idols. And um, he suggested that Vonnegut was the last of the great moral writers or moralists um, in that, uh, maybe not the last, but when Vonnegut died, he begins his essay, we lost one of our great moral voices. Um, and it was interesting because I was, so it, it prompted me to read a few lines of Vonnegut. And there's one of my favorites, which is, <laughs> God damn it, you got to be kind. Um, and it's, it's such a Vonnegut, like phrase to drop in the middle of an essay, that he was not afraid to preach to his audience 
about the essential, what he understood to be the essential raison d'etre for our humanity, which is to be kind to other people. Um, I, I share that only because, you know, we're reading a, a book of moral instruction. And uh, lest we think that it is the only book of its kind, the only book that teaches us about the meaning of a good life, you can find other voices in popular culture who were also in their own way, in their own language, trying to do that. Let's look at another text. And Judy, please chime Just in. To continue on that, um, in that vein, it's not only that one mitzvah leads, a minor mitzvah leads to another mitzvah, it's also you're spreading the mitzvah. It's a pay it forward. If you're kind, just to follow what you're saying, if you're kind, the person you're kind to is might be kind. And it's a, uh, spreading the good word to more than just your own, but to pass it on to others. So. Grace, thank you. And I, I, I would add, by the way, that there's a, another way of reading the text, which is no less valid. When you say one mitzvah leads to another, one transgression leads to another, or one transgression leads to a transgression. That is pretty straightforward. The word go rare it literally means to lead to or to pay forward, right? So that can mean that doing a mitzvah leads you to do another mitzvah, or as Judy proposes, it could induce another person to do a mitzvah. Similarly with a transgression, right? If you do a transgression, it could induce you to do more. It could induce others to do more. Additionally, the reward of a mitzvah, here they translate it, it says the reward for performing a commandment is another commandment. That's not the literal meaning of the text. The literal meaning of the text is something more challenging because it provides fewer words. Sechar mitzvah mitzvah. Literally, the reward of a mitzvah is a mitzvah. The reward, as it were, that's a loaded word, of a, a transgression is a transgression. In other words, doing, so another way of looking at it is not that the reward of doing a mitzvah is that you get to do another separate mitzvah. And similarly, the result or reward of doing a transgression is that you will be induced to commit another transgression. Another way of reading this, I think just as accurate is doing a mitzvah is its own reward and transgression is its own punishment. So before we move forward, any thoughts on that? Doing a mitzvah is its own reward and transgression is its own punishment. Yeah, Michelle. So I want to be careful about implying any deep knowledge of, um, you know, traditional orthodox uh, interpretation. However, my, however, I'm going to. <laughs> um, <laughs> my understanding or part of my understanding traditionally is that a fulfilled life at a minimum includes following the mates vote mm -hmm. and that's where you start and that's what you do now there are as we're seeing here other things layered on top of it such as uh, a goal for wisdom and happiness and honor and those sorts of things but your goal is God told, God provided a set of instructions. These are the mitzvot. You got to, you do them. And that will bring light into the world. Thank you. What's, and so that part to me makes sense in terms of this is how you live. What, what's put perhaps for strictly for pedagogical purposes, I don't know, the opposite that it bothers to mention the transgressions. Mm. Thank you. Now I'm hoping my dad who has a hand up or mom is about to say how comforted he feels by the fact that this is talking about the reward for doing a mitzvah is not reward in the hereafter, but rather it is its own reward. Am I right? Let's see. Yes, and I think this is, is really the foundation of tikkun olam. I mean, if the overarching pro, you know, uh, purpose, let's say, of, of the Jewish enterprise is to bring more perfection, more goodness to the world, then the fact that a mitzvah is done makes the world a better place. So that it, it's, it's, I think, you know, the Kabbalists sort of take this and run with it, that, that this is in fact what happens, that when you do mitzvot, you bring us closer, you bring the world, the cosmos closer to perfection. Indeed, that is exactly what they teach. Thank you. Okay, 
So let's look at the next one, which is the shortest in the sequence today. Um, and again, fairly straightforward. I love I love all of these teachings. He, presumably this means Ben Azai again, our previous teacher, Hu Haya Omer, he used to say, Al tihi vaz lechol adam, do not spurn um, or despise any other person. The al tihi maflig lechol davar, and do not discriminate against anything. Really interesting word, maflig. We can come back to that, to what that really means. Um, it could mean to exclude or to, um, uh, let's leave it as it is. I think discriminate is a pretty good translation. Do not discriminate against anything. And I want to highlight the way in the, the syntax here, the way in which this is um, constructed, this Mishnah. Do not do X against any Adam. I'm circling with my finger the word Adam. Do not spurn a person and do not different verb for a thing, devar. Do not spurn any person. And then it seems to be a parallel verb um, that would mean to discriminate against or similar to spurn though, um, disparage any thing. Davar means a thing. It can also mean experience. It can mean a word, but in this case, it means anything. And here's the rationale. adam, for there is no adam, there is no person. lo sorry for the double negative, but there is no person who does not have his hour. Sha'a, as they say, there is no man that has not his hour. There is no person who does not have his time. Ve'en lecha davar, and literally, you do not have a thing, she'en lo makom, that does not have a place. So it's a simple text in that it is very short, but it's a very complicated text, I think, in terms of this, the notion. So let's, let's unpack it one more time. I'll read it again in English. Ben Azai used to say, do not despise any man. We'll go with the gender translation. And do not discriminate against anything, for there is no man that has not his hour, and there is no thing that has not its place. Well, what the heck does that mean? What is up with this? Do not despise or spurn or disparage or give ill consideration to any other person. And do not, similar, do not hold in low esteem any thing, experience, object, for there is no person who has not his hour and there is no thing that has not its place. It's a lovely teaching, but what does it mean? Judy. It's value not only of humanity and human beings, but of the earth, of the sky, of the, it, this leads to an environmental um, principle um, and, and to anything, any vandalism that is done is a sin in a way. You're, you're destroying something that has been created by something or by mother nature or by some person. So it's, uh, be nice to everything and everybody. <laughs> it's a lovely text for, for those of us who wish to see within Judaism a strong moral voice for environmental consciousness. Thank you. And as for the hour, we got a question in the chat window. Could this refer to the hour of one's death? I'm suspecting not. I'm suspecting only from, con and it, that would not be inconsistent with other Jewish teachings, of course. The hour could refer to the hour of one's death. But I, su I suspect that in this case, the hour- Jonathan, is, I lost you. Oh, did you all lose me here? Yes. Am I back now? Well, I, I, I hear you clearly. Great. I, did, I okay. didn't lose you. Okay. Um, it can happen. Um, the internet, especially late mornings, I find on work days, the internet can be annoying. Um, so, uh, but y'all can hear me okay? Thank you for the, thank you for the red flag. Um, so, you know, in this case, I suspect that the hour um, actually means the kind of more like, I mean, I don't wish to make this crass or cheap, but like what Warhol said, right? Right. This is about one's moment to shine, one's hour of greatness or acclaim or 
one's hour to like make all of the difference in the world. Um, and then Russell, you ask a great question here. Maybe you'd like to come online and, and, uh, and elaborate. Does this mean that we can never sit in judgment over anyone? And how is that possible? I don't have any further perspective, okay. perspective to add, but it sounds as if, you know, basically, you know, don't ever look down on anyone, no matter how detrimental to society they may be, because they will all have their value. They all have their, their hour in the sun. Right, um, right. But don't we have to sit in judgment? Don't we have to work for justice? And doesn't that mean making distinctions between right. things that are good people who have done well and people who have done bad. I think so. And I think that again, maybe in its original context and, and appreciating the original context gives us a little bit of a way through that dilemma to wit. If this is in fact a training manual for adolescent rabbis in training um, and so much emphasis is given to the kind of rigor and purity of one's devotion to mitzvot and study of Torah, there are, I would say, no less in number and in emphasis, great teachings that, that populate Pirkei Avot that suggest that at the end of the day, though, you still have to be a person who appreciates the diversity of humankind. And you're going to be interacting with lots and lots and lots of different people. And part of what it means to be a rabbi, a teacher of the tradition, is to be able to appreciate the uniqueness and the potential gifts and blessings that every person brings. And let me tell you, this is, speaking as a rabbi, this is one of the hardest things about the life serving a large congregation, right? I mean, there are people that are just easier to deal with right, in congregational, in any life. There's, if, if it were up to me, sometimes I say I'd feel tempted to spend my time with the same 100 people because they're amazing. They love to study Torah. They care about the spiritual life. They are dedicated to tikkun olam. And then there are the people where my principal interaction with them is that it seems like no matter what we do as a synagogue, we never make them happy. They've been angry since we didn't give them the bat mitzvah date they wanted for their child. They've been angry since the person they wanted to do their mother's funeral, you know, was out of town that weekend and they had to have the other rabbi or the other cantor. And I, or they're the people who insist that their needs are the most important at the oneg. And I will tell you, one of the hardest things about just congregational service is to check oneself at the door and say, this person too is made in the image of God. And maybe even more, what can I learn from this person in this encounter? And I've just disclosed to you one of my many mantras that helps me serve a large and diverse and sometimes challenging congregation, right? It, the real test of, of rabbis is not how do you deal with the people who are easy to work with, it's how do you deal with the really hard people to work with. And so I think this idea of not spurning another person, as for not, you know, diminishing the place or the potential place of anything. I love Judy Gross's interpretation of that line as a reminder of the, the preciousness of all that is created, even things that are not living, rocks and stones, and even um, tools and, and things. It's like, think twice before you regard something as trash. Um, I'll share one more teaching from the wonderful Koran edition. The Talmud, uh, tractate Ta'anit 22b, so the Bab Babylonian Talmud, relates a story about Elijah the prophet, who pointed out two people and said that they had a place in the world to come. So sorry, dad, it's more about Olam Haba, but this is Elijah, who is the prophet of the Messiah, the one who announces the Mashiach. He says, those two guys, they have a place in the world to come. Who were these outstanding individuals? They were street comedians. They were not learned in Torah, nor were they renowned for their piety. When asked why they devoted their time to telling jokes, the comedians answered, we try to relieve people's suffering. We offer them a moment of laughter to free them from their woes. We use humor to bring peace among those who are arguing with each other. Although these street jesters might ordinarily be thought to be insignificant comedians, Elijah the prophet understood that they were remarkable individuals who were worthy of great reward 
in the world to come. So I just, I happen to love that, the way in which the editor brings that teaching. So just, you know, be careful. Uh, you might, uh, it is the, um, isn't it the fool in Hamlet who might have one of the most potent scenes in act five when he picks up the skull of your, uh, no, uh, Yorick, it's Yorick, a fellow of infinite jest, right? It, it kind of, it, it, the action, I, I wish I could quote it chapter and verse the way I can with Leviticus, but <laughs> given that Hamlet is sometimes better than some of Leviticus. Sorry, I just did what Pirkei Avot told me not to do. I disparaged something that seemed of, of less worth to me, um, the book of Leviticus. I love the book of Leviticus. Let's move on. Um, we're going to look at one more text to conclude today. We're going to get through four of these today. See, even with a 20-minute excursus on Benzoma and the Pardes, We've done so much. All right. Rabbi Levitas, a man of Yavne. Who is this fellow? Well, Rabbi Levitas of Yavne uh, from around the years, or I don't know if that was his life or his active period, but he was a scholar from Yavne. That's the original colony of scholarship, uh, of scholars that was established by uh, um, Yochanan ben Zakkai. In appealing to the Romans, he said, give me Yavna and its sages, and he established a community of teaching. So Rabbi Levitas was a scholar from Yavna who only appears once in the Talmud, and here it is, teaching about humility in Pirkei Avot. Hence, very little is known about him. So we might argue that he followed his own advice. He kept a very low profile. This is the guy who teaches us about being humble. Well, he's very humble. He only pops up once. Rabbi Levitas Ish Yavna, Omer. Me'od, me'od, very, very, me'od, me'od, really interesting formulation already. Be exceedingly humble of spirit, I would say of spirit. Heve shefal ruach, I love these phrases. Shefal ruach literally means downcast spirit or sh smushed, shefal, low to the ground, compressed. Have and ruach means so many different things. Elsewhere today, we've translated ruach as temper. It can mean wind. It can mean spirit in the sense of inspiration. It can mean breath. In this case, it can mean attitude, right? Don't have a haughty or a high attitude. Have a low attitude. Shetikvat enosh rima, for the hope of a mortal human being. Enosh is a wonderful word that implies one's mortality. The hope of a mortal is the worm. Here they say the end of man is the worm, but uh, tikva, you know that word from ha-tikva, shetikvat enosh. The best hope for a person is worms. That's the only teaching. Rabbi Yochanan ben Broca, Omer, this fellow, Rabbi Yochanan ben Broca, uh, one of his successors, a student of Rabbi Joshua, does not appear frequently in the Talmud, but many of his statements present a minority view about women. For example, he taught that the commandment of procreation applies to women as well as to men. Um, but here, his teaching goes like this. Seems unrelated, maybe it's related, we'll see. Kol ha shem shamayim basat baseter, anyone who profanes the name of heaven, that's a euphemism for God, anyone who disparages or blasphemes God, in secret, baseter, nifra'in mimenu vagalui, will be punished, or, uh, yeah, nifra'in punished, humiliated in public. If you blaspheme God, even in private, it's going to come to light and you will suffer publicly. Echad shogeg ve'echad mezid b'chilul Hashem. It goes on to say, whether intentional or unintentional, echad shogeg, meaning uh, whether you did it unwittingly, ve'echad mezid, or by design, intentionally, bechilul Hashem. It is all a profanation of the name. Whoa, lots going on in this text. Let's spend our last five minutes trying to unpack it. Rabbi Levitas says, be exceedingly humble, because your best hope is worm food. And then Rabbi Yochanan says, anyone who profanes God's name in secret will pay for it in public. Whether he did it willingly or wittingly or unwittingly, it is still a profanation of God's name. 
Do these teachings have anything to do with each other? Is it a mistake that they were bundled together in a single uh, Mishnah? I do not know. I've been thinking about this overnight and haven't come up with any answers. So now it's your turn. Um, Russell, why don't, you, why don't you give us your insights into the text? I'm not sure I would dignify it with the word insight. <laughs> okay. But um, insights I question. would say that ever since we read these, uh, these four passages, I've been impressed with the almost cacophony of contradictions uh, internally among them, things that uh, tell us we can aspire to something more elevated, uh, things that tell us that we are worms, <laughs> things that, and I wonder if every one of us who goes into the orchard is all four <laughs> of, the, of those people. Mm. Um, if, wow, if, okay, I mean, I, we should just, we should sit with that before we conclude, just the idea that the four who enter the orchard are actually archetypes for every person, and we yes. might embody the we might Im, embody those different characteristics. Go on. No, you 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 finished my thought better than I would have. So thank thank you very much. I wonder if everyone who goes into the orchard and takes this study seriously will find a certain element of of life and upliftment. Will find a certain level of alienation. Will find a certain thing that will leaves us perpetually in darkness mm. uh, and one who just leaves very happy in these passages i i myself feel all four of those those terrible things thank you for just giving us a beautiful metaphor for appreciating the paradoxical and self-contradictory nature of Pirkei Avot when you take it as a whole, right? If you're looking for rigorous internal consistency, you will not find it here. You will find texts that promise, and we've seen it in the course of a single 90-minute study today. We have seen texts that basically say, follow the straight and narrow because the reward for doing a mitzvah is a mitzvah. So this is one interpretation, right? You do it for its own sake. And the punishment is its own punishment. Um, and the ultimate benefit might be self-improvement. It might be, as Judy Gross suggested, um, improvement of others, right? You'll, it'll pay forward and other people will be inspired or inspired to do the wrong thing. Or as my dad said, it actually is the building block of repairing the world, of tikkun olam. Um, then you have texts that say, the reason we do all of this is so that we might be happy and prosper, not necessarily here in this world where we recognize from just looking around or reading the news on any given day that righteous people do not always prosper and righteous people are not always blessed with earthly happiness and wicked people sometimes seem really happy and also prosperous and that God's justice will be experienced only in the olam haba. And then you have this guy, Levitas, who comes along and says, you know, just be humble because you're worm food anyway. Like the, the most bleak statement, but he turns it into moral instruction as well. He's like, well, what's the takeaway? If you're just going to end up as food for worms, then maybe you shouldn't presume too much about your own ability to do anything <laughs> um, or, or whatever other spiritual attainment might come from cultivating a life of humility. It's wonderful to appreciate the paradoxical nature and the way in which maybe we are one, maybe we are more inclined toward one of these views or, pers uh, you know, motivations for pursuing the Judaism on a given day, and it's a different one on another given day. Or maybe, as Russell's to suggest, each of us embodies elements of the four who enter the orchard. And sometimes we come out with life-affirming uh, inspiration, and sometimes we feel really bleak and beaten down. Sometimes we go crazy. And then there are sometimes when you want to walk away from it, like Acher did. I, I love that, uh, bringing us full circle. Um, I, I wanted to add here that there is a fairly extensive, and we're not going to look at it. I will show it to you just so you can understand that this whole idea of you know, we really did just the first line, so we can pick up next week with the second uh, constellation of teachings about, um, about profaning the name of God. I think that's a significant concept, and I'd like to spend a little bit more time with it. I'll just point out, um, and this is 
partly so that I can remember to do this next week and I'll look back at the recording and say, oh yeah, I said, let's look at this. Um, so one of, the, one of the texts that will be important for understanding what is meant when a rabbi says profaning God's name is what the rabbis say elsewhere in Mishnah Yoma. This is the, uh, in, sorry, Babylonian Talmud, Tractate Yoma. This is the Babylonian Talmud on, nominally on Yom Kippur. Um, and it goes on to talk, you probably are familiar with the teaching that says, for sins between a person and God, the Day of Atonement atones. In other words, the Day of Atonement effectuates atonement. For sins between one person and another, the Day of Atonement does not atone until one has made peace with one's fellow. But there is a third category of sin that actually does not get reconciled easily by either Yom Kippur itself or by teshuva between one person and another, and that is one who has caused desecration of God's name. So this is a very hard sin to reconcile, at least according to rabbinic tradition. It says, in the case of one who has caused desecration of God's name, that person's repentance has no power to suspend punishment, nor does Yom Kippur have the power to atone for sin. So even observing Yom Kippur, even the Day of Atonement, can't erase the transgression of renouncing God or blaspheming God. Even if one suffers, nor does suffering alone have the power to absolve him. Rather, all of these, you need all of them. You need to make teshuva, you need to have Yom Kippur, and you need to suffer. Again, we'll talk about this next week. And death is what finally absolves him. That is very bleak, though it may be the missing piece that links the idea of desecrating God's name to the idea of humility because we're all worm food. Um, and then it even goes on, and this is what we'll look at next week, that talk about the various circumstances that cause desecration of God's name. Like, what does it actually mean? Is, is it a person standing up and saying, I renounce you, God? Or are there other earthly activities we might be engaged in that actually constitute a desecration of God's name? Um, I am leading you to believe that it is the latter, which it is. So we shall conclude for today. Um, thank you so much for joining our study. Um, go do some mitzvahs and pay it forward. And uh, I hope you have a wonderful Thanksgiving. We will reconvene a week, uh, two weeks from today. Um, so that will be uh, the 4th of December, I think. No, the 2nd of December, um, Hanukkah week. So have a wonderful Thanksgiving and also a Chag uh, Sameach, a very happy start to your Hanukkah festival. And I'll see you, see you two weeks from today at 10, 15 a.m. Oh, like I've old, Rabbi. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.